working in this area that we're going to be talking about tonight. So, so give him a great welcome. Go on. Well, good to be here. Great to see you guys coming out on a Tuesday night. I heard exams are around in this time frame. Unbelievable. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. There's no bigger question you can ask. It's funny. I, I teach up at an academy up in Atlanta, and it, ironically, last Friday, I was telling my students, trying to convince them not to buy a class ring and a letter jacket. You know why. Everyone in here knows why, right? Because you wear those on campus all the time, right? Your class ring, your letter jacket from high school. But I, I wasn't good enough to battle the Herf Jones consumer machine. So I, uh, you know, they won out. But, uh, but yeah, I was also going to give a handout to you guys. I, um, I, but I decided against it because even the insinuation of note taking after a day of lectures on a college campus is enough to get me burned at the stake. So no canned out, but we can, in the Q&A we can explore things. I can uh, follow up with you guys. I've got uh, emails from all over the world uh, for doing this sort of thing. Uh, I do teach philosophy, theology, apologetics, that sort of thing. Um, I, I have uh, worked with these guys. I'm actually a research assistant uh, to William Lane Craig, great guy. I know he sometimes comes off, the first time I met him, he came off like a logic chopping terminator uh, in his books and his debates, but he's actually a really, really uh, an extremely cool guy. I hope you guys get the chance to maybe get him down here sometime to talk with you guys. Um, I've been asked and, or tasked to try to tell you why I think it's rational to believe in theism. This is a particularly interesting subject given the fact that most college campuses' operational presupposition is naturalism. Uh, I would say atheism, but then there's people that get wrangled over that, that definition. Isn't that just a lack of a belief? Well, usually what fills the void of that lack, right, lack of believing in something is naturalism, the idea that there, there's no supernatural realm of any sort, no God or gods or anything like that. So I wanted to bring you just some brief reasons why I believe uh, theism makes rational sense. This is kind of a first step. If you don't believe there's a God, then the entire Bible doesn't make any sense, and Jesus was a deluded fool. So I, I wanted to lay these out, and since I've only gotten a half hour, you'll say thankfully a half hour, but the, the only, you know it's going to be, I mean you can intuitively know this, it's going to be um, a very quick and dirty sort of thing in the sense that um, I obviously can't cover all the bases. But I'm going to bring you four things and, I, and, and one of the things I want to start off with is a, a couple qualifiers. Um, what I find when you look online or by atheists today and naturalist is um, there's a significant lack of concessions being made before they speak to you about their non-belief in the supernatural or higher power. Um, you hear things like it's irrational to believe in a higher power. It's, uh, it's um, you know, that there's no evidence. There's no reason to believe in a higher power. These things are bandied around all the time that you are maybe insane or delusional. You know, Richard Dawkins' big, the God delusion in the early 2000s. Um, Everyone, it, it's being dishonest to say that somebody has to have a frontal lobotomy to believe in a higher power. That is, a, that is extraordinarily dishonest. Um, it, it, at best, it's uninformed. And that's one of the things I'm going to try to, to show you tonight is that this, when somebody uses those sort of extreme um, statements, I think they're just trying to score rhetorical points. Um, I, what you don't get are people that make concessions. In other words, I fully understand there might be naturalists or atheists, even in this crowd, that don't believe the theistic arguments warrant belief or casting your life upon these things. But to say there's no evidence at all, that's a, that's a very, very strong claim that it's just straight delusion or that you're insane or something, something to that effect. So. In the name of not doing what my opponents sometimes do, I wanted to give you some qualifiers or concessions up front. The first thing I want to do is lay my bias to bear so everybody knows, right, everybody's got bias. It's how you get through those biases that, you know, make a difference when you're trying to express an idea and persuade people. Uh, I've been a Christian for a long time, a couple decades. Um, I, I do think that Christianity makes more sense than any other religious tradition on the planet. I do think theism makes an extraordinary amount of sense as an explanatory um, uh, uh, idea, as well as something that can move the heart and something to cast your life upon. And it's been a very successful construct for, for my life in many ways. It's not the only reason I believe it's true, because it works, but it's been, it's been extremely beneficial. The second thing I wanted to say was that uh, I wanted to be honest about a weakness. I may give you four reasons you find plausible tonight for believing in a higher power without putting your mind on a shelf, but there's still the idea of divine hiddenness. I think there are good logical and theological reasons why God largely hides from those that love him and even those that don't. 
But this could be a counter. So again, I'm making a concession and saying, look, one of the counters to what I'm going to tell you tonight, that's a big counter, I would say, is that God remains hidden. He does express himself through general revelation, but he does hide as well. And this is true all throughout the Bible, even where the Bible seems to look like 613 miracles, it looks ripe with miracles. God spends long periods of time not being available to those that do great things for the kingdom. So this is a, uh, this is a constant theme in the Bible that we kind of bypass. Um, last, I, I, another way to qualify my bias besides telling you about it and giving you a, a possible rebuttal, right, with divine hiddenness. I also wanted to let you know that I'm going to be quoting largely non-believers tonight. I'm going to try to make my case by using people that disagree with my worldview. And I will, after I make the argument, I'll try to give you some quotes. It'll be very quick because I only have a little bit of time. But I'll try to give you quotes from some of the, not just some guy at a community college somewhere, but leaders in their field that have said these sort of things. And then I'll finish up with the conclusion where I'll try to show you that just so you don't think this is only convincing to those that are already convinced of a higher power, some notable, very notable uh, big names in academia that have completely switched gears and abandoned naturalism uh, in, in favor of some version of theism or some other uh, paradigm for explaining things. I also wanted to let you know I'll be working from what's called an abductive point of reference. That means we're going to look at what makes the best sense, what has the smoothest fit with what. What sort of ideas have a smooth fit bef between what we experience every day and take for granted and largely never think about and what doesn't. And I'm going to argue that theism has a much more smoother contextual fit than the rival that that we refer to as naturalism. Um, the first area I want to bring you of four is the area of cosmology. Uh, cosmology is the study of beginnings of things, uh, usually the study of the beginning of a universe, solar system, these sort of things. Uh, there was a seismic shift that happened in cosmology um, about 60, 70 years ago that the, the modern scientific presupposition was that the, the universe always was here. And if the universe was always here, then you don't need a, a, a you don't need to worry about anything that came before or outside of the universe. If time, space, and matter are eternal, then guess what? Then you don't have to worry about talking about something outside of space, time, and matter that might have caused it. This was overturned in about 1956 for a number of scientific reasons. There were always good philosophical reasons to doubt the idea of an eternally old universe, but there were scientific reasons that were coming to bear mounting up that has, according to Stephen uh, Hawking, has literally converted the last naysayer. Everyone believes that there is a, in the, in the area of cosmology and in most sciences, that there was a beginning to the universe. Now, again, in our reality, when things begin, there's beginners. When things start, there are starters. So in the, in the debate over whether something started the universe, right, it looks more plausible to say that something or someone started this thing we call space, time, and matter rather than nothing. Um, so what you get, interestingly, is a lot of people wrangling over the definition of nothing, right? Uh, you have physicists say, well, when, when I say nothing, I don't mean philosophically nothing, right? Because the philosophical definition of the word nothing is no potentiality, no thing, nothing. And from nothing, nothing comes, right? Some other folks say, well, no, 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 nothing is just something that isn't constituted just like physical things. So you have somebody like Lawrence Krauss, right, a very outspoken atheistic physicist that says, no, 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 uh, there's, a, there's a, a quantum field. Well, that requires space, and it's not nothing. And he says, and out of this quantum field, a purposeless burp of this quantum field created our universe, everything that we see and everything that we experience. So um, the idea is that, well, look, beginnings have beginners. And I know this doesn't get you very far, we'll maybe explore it in the Q&A, to getting you all the way to the robust idea of a Christian view of a higher power. But it does mean minimally this, that if you have a series of contingent finite things, you need what? You need a, an infinite, right? An infinite being, at least infinite in quality, and you need something that is necessary, right? A first cause. Right, that causes this thing to come to be. And there have been a number of cosmologists that have defended the idea that God makes best sense of what kind of being would have the resources to create space, time, and matter from a beginning point. Again, if there's no beginning point, there's no need to talk about this. Interestingly enough, the Bibles you read, hopefully, are one of the only holy books on the planet that have a beginning to the universe. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. So uh, interestingly enough, you, you have this going on. So. Um, the idea is in the competition between nothing creating everything and someone creating everything, uh, someone looks to be a more plausible option if you look at how things work on our planet. 
right? When things begin, there are beginners. When things start, there are starters. So this has been an interesting thing. By the way, that even, even the term Big Bang, right, was a derogatory term. It was, uh, uh, it, it was popularized by a guy named Arthur Eddington who hated what he called the metaphysical implications of a first cause. He didn't like the idea of a beginning of the universe because it made you think about something that brought it to be. And he didn't want to think about that as a scientist. So there have been many, many people that continue to try to move us back to that eternal universe model rather than the, be the beginning. Stephen Hawking, Al Alexander Vilenkin, they have all kind of come around and said, well, maybe we don't want to go to a god, but we're going to say that there obviously was a beginning to the universe. And usually beginnings, even Hawking says, the logical corollary of having a beginning is a beginner. So I'm going to try to give you another 200 pages to tell you why that beginner is not something you should believe in. And maybe we can talk about what he says uh, in the Q&A. The chances of anything coming from nothing are exactly zero. So that's, that's why there was this sort of uh, general push to not uh, follow the, uh, this sort of cosmological shift to its, to its implications for uh, a being outside of space and time. The second thing is a twofold uh, argument. It has to do with uh, fine tuning and complexity. There's been an enormous amount of data flowing. 1945, continuous data that's told us quite clearly that things are highly, highly complex. Um, living things especially. Um, you guys have probably studied DNA and genetics in your classes here. Uh, DNA is, uh, the study of DNA was the, what, according to Francis Collins, right, arguably one of the top geneticists on the planet, head of the Human Genome Project. It started his book called The Language of God. He said, I thought I was looking at a book that God wrote. DNA has an information content that is very, very rich. It's the building block, right, or the building blocks of your life, right? It is a specific, specified, and complex code. Those don't arise on their own in matter. We, have never, we don't have any observational evidence of information arising on its own by itself in matter. It's just an assumption you have to go with as a naturalist. Um, again, Francis Collins said the straw that broke the camel's back was an atheist all through college. Right, I'm going to mention him here at the end as well in the conclusion. He said the straw that broke the camel's back was his study of DNA. He said there was just no naturalistic story that seemed to fit what he was observing and what he was studying. Uh, let me give you some quotes from some people that are not believers about this sort of thing. This is a, a famous uh, physicist named John Wheeler summarized how his thinking shifted over the years. When I first started studying, I saw the world as composed just of particles. Looking more deeply, I discovered waves. Now, after a lifetime of study, it appears that all existence is the expression of information. Again, any naturalist will tell you information does not spontaneously arise on its own. A combination of specified and complex things don't come together on its own. And that means when the specified and complex thing comes together, it points to something beyond just the uh, information itself. Bernard Carr and Martin Rees, two outspoken cosmologists that are atheists, speak of nature's remarkable coincidences that warrant some sort of explanation. Um, take somebody like Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins himself said, look, biology is the study of complicated things that appear to be designed. There's a strong sort of intuitive pull to design when you look at things in the living world, right? Uh, Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of the DNA double helix. Uh, Francis Crick, similar sort of thing, outspoken atheist, but both hates Christianity. He said, well, I, when, you, when, I tell, when I see my students looking through the microscope, I constantly have to remind them that what they're looking at is not designed. The only reason you have to constantly remind somebody of something is that there's a strong impression, overwhelming impression of design coming through what they're observing. Crick even said this, the origin of life looks like almost a miracle. He was part of a conference where there were a number of physicists and chemists that tried to figure out what's, what's a plausible way of explaining the origin of first life. And after being frustrated time after time again, in fact, the guy who covered it was a German um, a German reporter that said it was the most depressing conference for a naturalist that you'd ever, that you'd ever go to. There's, every time somebody bring up a, a speculative theory, it was shot down, which caused Crick to even say, well, maybe, maybe aliens seeded the planet with cells. Panspermic theory, right? You shot a missile with living, fully functional cells and DNA in it, so you just move the question to another planet is the idea. Um, what about uh, fine-tuning? Fine-tuning is a religiously neutral statement. It's an observation about now that our technology has advanced, it started uh, coming to the fore in about the mid-80s and on. Um, as our technology continues to increase, we're able to measure certain quantities on our planet and our solar system and what we extrapolate out to the outer, uh, uh, outside of our solar system to the broader universe. Uh, the anthropic uh, uh, principle is a, is a principle that again is religiously neutral, but you have to find one way, you have to find a way you're gonna explain fine tuning. You usually have about three ways. What's fine, again, fine tuning are these 
enormously improbable constants that have a very, very precise and narrow range of possibility that allow for first matter formation, so it's not just life, and then second, that allow for life to be. And what, I mean, this is um, uh, uh, idiomatically called the Goldilocks effect, right? That, you know, this part is too hot, this part is too cold, this is just right. At last check, there was about 155 of these, and they're still counting. Um, they have their galactic constants, like, for example, the nuclear weak force, entropy condition, uh, gravitational force, speed of light, that if they're not precise to a mind-boggling degree, you don't have any matter. Forget life, no matter, no stars, no meteorites, no planets. Then you have local constants, right? If things are off just by a hair, right, you, you don't get life. Right? Now, remember, up till about the 80s, we were told by naturalist scientists that any, a life-permitting universe is just as common and just as likely as a non-life-permitting universe. You know, uh, a universe didn't, it, it, you know, it hadn't begun, right? It didn't begin, it's always been. So uh, we now know definitively that there is no, the, the, it, the idea of life beginning somewhere, let's put it this way, a life-producing universe is extremely rare then a life-permitting universe is extremely rare, and then a life-sustaining universe is even more rare. So you start to combine these ratios on top of one another, and it starts to become an, an astoundingly difficult argument. Now, what are your three options to explain fine-tuning? You can say chance, but that's just a tricked-out way of saying I don't know. That's chance, right? I, I don't know that sounds scientific. You can say design, right, that fine-tuning has a tuner, right? DNA codes have coders. Right, but that may not be allowed. Or you can go multiverse, which for a lot of atheists is an extremely um, ungratifying hypothesis. It's a possible hypothesis that there are multiple undetected universes around us that all got it a little bit wrong and ours got it just right. The reason it's ungratifying to them is not only is it not empirically detectable and people that love science detest that sort of thing, of course, but the second reason is because you still don't get out of trying to explain why this universe is just so fine-tuned. And, and plus, it looks like you'd need something like a, a, a universe generator that itself was fine-tuned. So you have a number of issues with this sort of thing. Let me give you some non-believers uh, that discuss uh, the fine-tuning argument um, really, really quickly, just as I, before I move on to the next one. Perhaps one of the, what they call the layman's atheists is a guy named Michael Shermer. Online, he's, a, uh, he's an, uh, an atheist, very, very popular online. He's a former pastor, evangelical pastor, converted out. Of his, uh, of his Christianity and has become an outspoken critic of uh, theism, Christian theism in particular. Michael Shermer, in his book, The Believing Brain, begrudgingly concedes, says, but I'm begrudgingly conceding, that the so-called fine-tuning problem is the best argument theists have for the existence of God. And our deployment of the multiverse is one of the most ungratifying things that we've come up with. So he's waiting anxiously for something besides a multiverse explanation for fine-tuning anthropic constants and uh, the, uh, the Goldilocks effect. Uh, there's a gentleman, this is anecdotal I know, but it, it'll give you a little insight as to what I'm talking about as well. There's a gentleman at uh, Biola University named Dr. Michael Horner. I believe it's Michael Horner. It's Dr. Horner. He's got his philosophy degree, PhD from Oxford University. Dr. Horner overheard one of the most prestigious atheistic biologists at Oxford while he's getting his PhD there discussing, he was walking by the classroom and heard Anthony Kenny discussing with his PhD students some topics. And he overheard Kenny say something like this, quite frankly, as an atheist, I have no idea what to do with this evidence. He was discussing fine tuning. I do believe that this material provides evidence that there is a supreme being of some kind. His students were stunned. This guy's been teaching us from a naturalist, atheistic background, and now he's saying, there's good evidence for a higher power. Kenny said he just chose to wait. He basically gave his naturalism an IOU. I'll wait until we come up with something that, you know, that can basically try to out undo this, this, these new discoveries when it comes to uh, fine tuning and anthropic constants. Uh, anecdotal, I know, but I wanted to, to give you an example. By the way, uh, Horner is a brilliant person, right? One of those stupid people that went to Oxford and got his PhD. So, because uh, it takes a stupid person to believe in a higher power, right? The next thing I wanted to bring you very, very quickly was moral considerations, right? Um, there's been a lot of confusion online about the moral argument and even in, in debates and things like this. Um, just like there is like this wrangling over the definition of nothing with a cosmological argument, with the uh, moral argument, people get all bent out of shape and uh, it, it create straw men everywhere. So I want to give a couple of qualifiers before I get started, but the, the word they get hung up on is the word objective, objective. Um, 
So I want to give some qualifiers. When someone presents the moral argument, they're, they're not, it's not a matter of moral on, uh, epistemology, it's a matter of moral ontology. To unpack that a bit, it means something like this. We're not talking about whether a naturalist can recognize moral norms or act in a moral way. Nor is anyone worth their salt saying that if you're an atheist or naturalist, you're going to become a Hitler or a Mussolini or a Stalin. That's, that's a straw man, right? No one worth their salt saying that. What they are saying is this. This doesn't look like a good contextual fit for rights-bearing beings. What are morals? Why do they have what's called incumbency and force upon us? What are they? It seems like at best an odd fit to say a valueless, random, chaotic process somehow conferred value that we all recognize on human beings. That doesn't have a good contextual fit. And what is your standard for right and wrong? If you say any of the standards is within the human being or the collection of human beings, whether you're you know, a social contract theorist or whether you're a person that believes in uh, maybe conventionalism, a kind of group relativism, which is uh, just another way of saying uh, a, a social contract, a Hobbesian social contract, or if you say, I'm an individual relativist, it seems odd to say that you can somehow get objectivity where there's no external or transcendent standard of what's right and wrong. Christians have traditionally said God's nature serves as that standard. Now, I know you probably heard deployments about the euthyphro argument to kind of undo this sort of thing, but that's the argument. The argument is, look, what are ethics? Where's the standard coming from? It's not whether you can detect it. Christians have always said anybody has this sort of moral ESP to them, can pick up on the idea of moral norms and a moral standard. They can even act in, in, in concert with moral norms. And I'm not saying for a second, for a second, that Christians always act in concert with a moral standard. But the idea is that's what gets missed here. It's not that. It's saying, what are they? Where's the standard? And isn't this an odd fit, a valueless, random, chaotic process that somehow through the, what, the rearrangement of material particles confers an ethical theory of some sort of value or, or, or even purpose, right? For example, uh, uh, somebody who knows this argument really well would say something like this, I don't see any reason that I could bring to somebody who is, say, like a rational egoist. That means somebody who says, well, I'll feign respect for my neighbor as long as I don't get caught, so it serves my best interest. And the minute I won't get caught or I can deceive someone, I'm going to do that because I, I'm, look, I'm only, a, uh, I'm only here for 70 plus odd years if I'm lucky. So why not just do that? I don't have, there's, if there's no objective morality, I don't know any way in principle of, of defeating that argument. Just do what you can do, act within the confines of what you can, and when you can defy the confines, defy them over and over again. Further, I don't see how somehow if you are a swarm of atoms on which consciousness sort of just emerges, I don't know how you would call that valuable. Just a reconfiguration of particles a la naturalism that somehow brings about value or a special sort of something uh, to, your, uh, to your life. So it's, again, it's not an issue of moral epistemology. Can they recognize and act, right? It's a matter of moral ontology. What are morals? Is this a good contextual fit for values, the, the, the origin story in naturalism? And uh, what is, if, if you're without an external transcendent standard, where, where is the standard lie for this sort of thing? Um, again, we can talk about the, uh, this sort of thing in the Q&A, but let me give you a couple of uh, Quotes, again, remember, valuable, intrinsically valuable, not functionally valuable. That means your value only comes from what you do. But intrinsically valuable beings, regardless of uh, what you do, thinking persons do not tend to come from what? Impersonal, non-conscious, guided, unguided, valueless processes. Let me give you a couple of uh, non-believers. One of the most famous uh, um, ethicists that's an atheist is a guy named J.L. Mackey, used for years in three different books, The Argument from Evil Against the Idea of God's Existence. Listen to this. If there are objective moral values, big if, they make the existence of God more probable than without them, which is just the basic basis of my argument, basically, that if morals are more than mere opinion, which we all intuitively <laughs> assume, right, it's the cornerstone of building civilizations, that it's more than just mere opinion, then theism becomes enormously probable if that's the case. Two, Mackey again, moral properties constitute so, listen, so odd a cluster of properties and relations that they are most unlikely to have arisen in the ordinary course of events without an all-powerful God to create them. This is a known atheistic ethicist. Uh, evolutionary biologist William Provine, University of Chicago. There are no inherent moral or ethical laws that exist in my, in, in, on my worldview, nor are there absolute guiding principles for human society. 
Hence, I don't have to worry about a God that grounds them. Agnostic philosopher, I believe at Purdue, Paul Draper, a moral world is very, very probable on theism. These are people that radically disagree with my Christian worldview or my theistic, particular theistic worldview that are saying generally what I'm trying to express to you here. The last one, very, very quickly, is the idea of consciousness, reason, and free will. And again, these issues, guys, I'm going over them so fast, I apologize. It's just, you know, we don't want to keep you here too long tonight, even though these are big issues. People have written books, done, and done life's work on these issues, morality, right? Beginning of the universe, cosmology, astronomy, these sort of things. Um, consciousness, reason, free will, right? Volition, these are things people spend lifetimes studying. So I, I apologize for skimming, but that's, that's the nature of us doing this very, very quickly. Um, the origin and presence of consciousness makes very, very little sense if your brain is just a, a different configuration of atoms. You can use words like epiphenomenalism or supervenience to hide the fact that this is a mystery. Nearly every naturalist neurologist says this is a, this is a, a research project that we're, we're at a zero point. We don't know how consciousness and, and, and co what they call full color um, uh, uh, phenomenology, right? The, the, uh, the phenomenon of full color thoughts come by way of soggy gray matter behind your eyes and above your nose. Consciousness seems to be a great, great mystery, but it makes better sense if you begin with mind, not matter, in your creation story or in your origin story. Okay? It's a much better contextual fit. If your brain's just a brute piece of meat or matter, according to the materialist or naturalist, it really has no first person perspective like we assume every day. It has no free will. Its behavior is totally fixed by the laws of nature. Your, your mind works in a mechanistic way. This is what's always gotten me about atheists that admonish us to use our brain. Use your mind. Come to reason and enact your free will against this superstition. Called, you're assuming consciousness, free will, and reason, all of which make very, very little sense given your worldview. We don't tend to trust irrational, chaotic things to give us actionable information. That's what reason and logic is, a, a conceptual tool of the mind. Mind, not brain, right? So the idea here is we don't trust, if your brain is the end product of an accidental random process, there's no reason to trust the deliverances of it. When you, uh, C.S. Lewis used a milk example, it's a little technical, let me just use this one. Imagine you have uh, a bunch of tiles, I used to do Scrabble, now it's words with friends, but either way, you got a bunch of random letters and you drop them on the floor and you start to go pick them up and your brother or sister comes in and goes, stop, and they see B-A-L on the floor. If he went and booked a ticket to Baltimore, you'd call him a fool. But that's taking a random event and trying to get truth and actionable information out of it. We know intuitively that we don't trust random events to give us accurate, actionable, truthful information. So um, we also know you can't get a first person point of view from brute matter, right? What's a first person point of view? Anybody play first person shooters, you know what I'm talking about, where it looks like you're looking through the eyes of someone rather than over the shoulder third person. We don't generally get that for matter, and, and quite frankly, you have somebody like a um, naturalist neurologist like Ned Block saying, frankly, we're stumped. I, there's no, I mean, we're still looking at this sort of thing, but this is why there's a, a split, right, in the, in the world of epistemology about whether there's a soul or not. I don't know if you ever thought about that. That's a pretty important issue. Many, many people in the Bible assume the soul is an authentic entity, an immaterial aspect, very important aspect of who, ah, not going to get far afield. Anyway, back to the, the idea here is that you have a better contextual fit with a, a, a being like God that starts and sustains the process of bringing human beings to be, rather, and that makes sense of things we take for granted like free will, volition, right, consciousness, rationality, and things like that. Um, even if you go locally, forget uh, the, uh, the origin story ultimately, right, chaos and randomness, even if you just go to survival, you still don't have a reason to trust your thoughts, right? I mean, you can believe lies and survive better. Even if you say natural selection and, you know, kind of paper over with that sort of thing, you still have the issue of why trust the thoughts that a natural selected brain produced. I can survive very well believing a number of lies. So that doesn't confer truth even if you go to the local scenario of development by way of your brain. Um, let me give you some people that agree with me on this. Uh, Richard Dawkins, right, the high pope of atheism. There is no right or wrong, good or evil. So that kind of goes back to the moral considerations point before. Only DNA, and we dance to its music.
There's no right or wrong, no good or evil. It's only DNA, and we dance to its music. Which makes me wonder why in the God Delusion he spent two chapters talking about how immoral and evil Christians were. Seems kind of odd, right? I'll just dance in my DNA. Let's have a laugh about it. Uh, I, I, you can laugh at the Pope's funny hat, right? Uh, there's no, I can't, I don't have a will to choose, right? If your brain just operates by the laws of physics mechanistically, you don't have a free will. You can't choose, I'm the way I am just because of the inputs and outputs of the physical environment in my mind, or my brain, and my body. Nobel laureate atheist, one Francis Crick, we mentioned before, the uh, Nobel Prize winner for discovering the double helical structure of DNA, and Jacques Monod, right, the famous mathematician. Naturalism and evolution leave us with a world free of ultimate purpose, moral obligation, free will, and rationality. Listen to this from atheist philosopher Clancy Martin, Midwestern philosopher. The existence of consciousness in this world of matter ought to make you wonder about God and the possibility of an afterlife. Because whatever consciousness is, it is nothing you've ever smelled, tasted, or touched, or heard. It is something very, very different than everything else around you. If we have any intimation of immor immortality, it is the fact that we have and use our minds. I think there's more reasons than that, but that's, he's saying, gosh, when it comes to consciousness, I, I don't have a clue as a naturalist. <clears throat> As we conclude, I wanted to mention a couple things and then I'm going to give you a, a list of people. You might be thinking this is only convincing to somebody that already, you already told us you're already a believer. Um, I'm going to try to share with you people, again, that radically disagree with my worldview and are some of the top in their field that these, these issues I've told you about have actually converted them. The more they've looked at them, the more they feel like naturalism can't get the job done. And they switch over to the number one rival to naturalism, an idea of theism. Right, but before I do that, if we're going to reject a hypothesis because it can't answer our questions, I don't know why anybody would ever become an atheist or a naturalist. You have massive explanatory gaps in your mind, your noetic structure, when you switch over. Uh, the famous uh, uh, English theologian G.K. Chesterton used to say, when hard times happen, people tend to turn away from God. But in heaven's name to what? It's not like your, your questions are better answered over here. Your questions aren't even justified when you switch over here. You know, you hear this all the time. Christians say things like, well, you know, I had this question X, and my pastor couldn't answer it. My parents couldn't answer it. My friends couldn't answer it, so there must not be an answer, right? And then they become atheists or skeptics. I, I wonder about that a little bit, right? Because you're not getting more answers on naturalism. You, it's not like you go over here and, oh, I should have had a V8. You, you've got, you, you, can't even, you, you can't even explain the questions over here. The questions are moot. You shouldn't even be asking a question about what somebody should choose, what they should believe. Using their logic and reason, using their mind in a proper way. What's proper? What is a mind? What is reason? What is consciousness? Now, just in case you think this is a God of the gap scenario, you're taking something we don't understand and just plugging God in. No, these are inferences to the best explanation. We do this all the time. We see some information. We're working from the known to the unknown. We, this is a very standard procedure in forensics. It's a standard procedure in, uh, uh, in, in courts of law. It's a standard procedure uh, when archaeology. We do this all the time. So it's not a God of the gap scenario going on here. What it is is just, okay, given our experience of what happens, what makes the best sense of these things that may be beyond us or beyond our, our ability to, uh, to, um, uh, to fully cognitively grasp? All right. Um, so just in case you might have gotten the impression this is probably, what he's saying is probably only convincing to people in this room that already believe. The first guy I wanted to bring you, I'm going to bring you seven people, okay? And the first guy I wanted to bring you is a, is a gentleman that I had the, the wonderful experience of getting to know because he's friends with a friend of mine. His name's Anthony Flew. Anthony Flew is regarded as the most philosophically astute atheist of the 20th century, or at least one of them. You Google Anthony Flew's name, you'll see paper after paper fly about how philosophical naturalism atheism is the best position. Anthony Flew converted to deism before he died. The idea there's a God that's at least started the universe and makes sense of all these things, the effects called the universe, things like that. He didn't switch all the way over to Christian theism. One of his best friends was one of my friends, a guy named Gary Habermas. Uh, Habermas and he had a long-running relationship. They had a very friendly back and forth, couple debates in their lifetime. But Flew switched and he said, here are the two reasons. Here's the first one. If it's true, he waited and waited and waited for somebody to say the universe didn't begin to exist. He was waiting all these theories, steady state, right, ekpyrotic scenarios, the, uh, um, the idea of uh, an inflationary model, the, uh, the, uh, the Big Bang, Big Crunch model, all of them kept failing, he said. And he said, look, I knew enough philosophy to know that if there was a beginning, right, that implies a beginner. 
right? If you have a, a series of contingent things that are finite in the past, you need a non-contingent necessary thing that's outside of these things that makes sense of their existence. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Gonna be a dance party in the middle? That'd be kind of cool, right? Everybody just kind of, we have it on film. Uh, but uh, yeah, so Flew said that's the first reason. Here's the second. He goes, the flood of information over and over again of the complexity of life and the fine tuning of the universe. He said this is over and over. He said they just, the, it was a flood of information just kept coming in. And he said, I kept feeling like my naturalism became weaker and weaker and weaker. He was interviewed by Newsweek, Time, ABC, NBC. As a matter of fact, in an interview with ABC's Peter Jennings, he said, you know, I had a lot of very, very famous atheist friends in the 20th century, Bertrand Russell, A.J. Eyre of the now defunct uh, verification school. He said, if these guys were confronted and lived as long as I did and were confronted with this information, I have no doubt if they were confronted with this data, they would have converted. Very, very interesting admission from Anthony Flew. Oh, by the way, atheists were in a tizzy over this sort of thing, right? How can, in the world can Antony Flew? So they said two things about him, right? They said, one, he's, he's getting senile. He's an old man. He's 79 years old. Gags off his rocker, right? After which he wrote a book showing that he's still just as philosophically acute. He hadn't, he hadn't lost a step when it came cognitively. And then they said, okay, we wrote the book, and it seems to be a pretty strong book. But all right, the problem with Antony Flew is he's afraid of death. He's afraid of dying and going to hell. And Antony Flew said, I, I don't even believe in hell and heaven. I don't know about those things. I haven't foreclosed on those issues. So I'm not just afraid of heaven or hell, uh, of not going to heaven and going to hell. I'm also not just senile. He even laughed and said, you know, I was kicked out of the, the English Free Thinkers Club because my free thought brought me to a higher power. That's not allowed. Your free thinking cannot go outside of the naturalistic box. Second gentleman I wanted to bring you uh, is a guy very recently... Uh, uh, been, been brought up in the news a lot. It's a guy named Thomas Nagel, New York University philosopher of law, philosopher and, and legal expert. Um, very, very uh, well-respected professor, been an outspoken naturalist for years. Outspoken. Um, he even is famous for saying, I don't want theism to be true. I don't want the universe to be that way. I don't want a being like that looking at me and telling me what to do. I have an emotional commitment to naturalism. He wrote a book called The Most Hated Book by, I think, the London Times in 2012 called Mind and Cosmos. Listen to the subtitle. Why the materialist neo-Darwinian conception of human nature is almost certainly false. Again, why the materialist neo-Darwinian conception of human nature is almost certainly false. Um, the general response from his atheistic colleagues at New York University was, why are you telling people this? Just stop talking about this. We'll figure it out, right? Naturalism IOU, we'll get back to you, right? Um, what were the four reasons in his book, if you had to sum up the book very quickly, the four reasons he said this about naturalism. By the way, he didn't become a deist or a theist. He became what's called a panpsychist. We'll talk, maybe talk about that in the Q&A. But he found some other philosophical, more Eastern idea to kind of, kind of not avoid moving over to deism or theism, a la Antony Flew. He said, first, the emergence of, in a, from a lifeless universe of first life and it being so staggeringly, his words, staggeringly complex, makes no sense given my naturalism. Two, the development of an, the incredible diversity of highly complex life forms from this first life, the, the problem of multiplicity from that first life and, and variation. He said, in such a short time and such variation and diversity makes no sense given my naturalism. The appearance of conscious beings from brute matter makes no sense given my naturalism. And there have been many people that have tried. And last, the existence of objective reason and value and humans that can recognize moral value and intrinsic worth of people and use reason. He said naturalism can't even handle these basic features that we take for granted in our existence. Uh, he was featured on a magazine called The Weekly Standard where he was literally being burned at the stake while professors were all around him. Right, kind of an interesting uh, image there. Um, third guy I wanted to bring you was a gentleman named Michael Denton. Michael Denton for years was an atheist, a friendly critic of Darwinism. Uh, he said many, many things about how he thought the neo-Darwinian conception wasn't right. He's a microbiologist. Uh, he was, like I said, just a friend. He had a lot of friends, uh, atheist friends of his, that he would kind of challenge them, push them a little bit on the Darwinian conception of, uh, of, our, of, of the, sort, the Earth origin story. He's now a deist. Listen to this. The order of nature is uniquely suited to life as it is on earth. Nature has a peculiar fit for carbon-based Terran life that calls for an explanation. 
And he basically said, my naturalism had absolutely no resources to handle this sort of thing. I've mentioned Francis Collins, the uber geneticist, wrote the book called The Language of God. He said, I had become an atheist in high school. Um, I vacillated between atheism and agnosticism for a while. And then he said, I started to feel like my, my atheism was kind of childish. That's interesting. We're called childish for believing in a higher power, right? We kind of have this belief that our parents fobbed off on them. You grow up. You're like, that's Santa Claus for adults, right? Maybe talk about that in the Q&A. Awful, awful. But anyway, Collins said, look, uh, I started to feel my atheism was a bit childish. Then, when he got into his master's and PhD programs, he said everything I was studying didn't have a naturalistic story. The naturalistic story didn't make sense of a majority of things I'm studying as I'm becoming one of the best geneticists on the planet. The straw that broke the camel's back was looking at the human genome and going, this is the, what his book's called, The Language of God. I felt like I was looking at a book that was authored by someone. And he said, this was the straw that broke the camel's back. I just couldn't go back to naturalism. Became a believer, again, on the evidence. Not he wa it wasn't because of indoctrination. Um, <clears throat> Frank Tipler is a, uh, is a, a very well-known physicist. He was an atheist for most of his career. Uh, came to a belief in a higher power uh, in his late 40s. Um, in his book, he says this in the introduction. Listen to this. When I began my career as a cosmologist, study of the origin of things, some 20 years ago, I was a convinced atheist. I've never in my wildest dreams imagined that one day I'll be writing a book purporting to show that the central claims of the Judeo-Christian Judeo theology are deductions of the laws of physics as we now understand them. I have been forced, forced into these conclusions by the inexorable logic of my own special branch of physics. Uh, Fred Hoyle, a uh, famous uh, atheistic astronomer, mathematician, uh, English professor, spent decades trying to get around two things, he said, that haunted him when he laid his head on the pillow. One was a beginning universe. How would that haunt him? Because it cries out for a, some type of beginning or something beyond the universe itself. If your worldview says the only, thing that's, the only things that are real are things that occupy space, have weight, mass, and everything that you've observed has that sort of thing, but it all began somewhere, that implies something outside or different, fundamentally different than that. He said he couldn't get around. He spent years trying to uh, literally come up with theories around this idea. He also said that the idea of this is before fine tuning, but the idea of all this complexity, both on our planet and outside. He said, have you ever wondered about the mathematical elegance, how our mathematical theories match on the planet that we didn't make and the, the space that the planet occupies outside, it's amazing that our mind, uh, something in our mind matches these things. There's a matchup. Um, there's a, a, a professor at Harvard that made the same uh, point in one of his books. He called it the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. If you're a naturalist, mathematics matching up, the deliverances of a human mind matching up with, right, things we didn't make that we find in our environment don't make much sense on naturalism. That's Eugene Wigner. Listen to the, the, the Fred Hoyle quote I wanted to bring you that kind of sums up his journey to deism. A common sense interpretation, not a faith-based, not a belief, not an opinion. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology. There are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature which is why, one of the reasons why Dawkins made, you know, authored the book called The, the Blind Watchmaker after Hoyle said this sort of thing. Um, the last guy I wanted to bring you is not necessarily a guy that's converted over, but he's a, no friend of Christianity. He's a contributor to the New York Times named David Brooks. He's an agnostic, professing agnostic. Uh, David Brooks uh, wrote a very interesting article last year called, uh, that was entitled something like Neural Buddhism. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes from it. But basically, this very well-respected journalist had gone around and interviewed professors in Europe and in the United States and in Canada. And he said this, that naturalism's dying. It cannot explain features of our reality as smoothly or as plausibly as theism or some version of theism. But he said, that's not the end of the story. He goes, humans don't like having a vacuum. There's just nothing in these places that are supposed to, we're supposed to have explanations for these sort of things, or at least an attempt at an explanation. He goes, naturalism's been given a try. It's the operative presupposition at university. But he said, I think what, according to my interviews with these professors, what I think's coming is, is either Christianity, Christian theism, or what's called neural Buddhism, a combination of new age ideas, some fuzzy sort of, sort of Buddhistic ideas, and a combination of that and neurobiology, or the neurophysiology and neurosciences. Um, listen to some of the quotes. Uh, Over the past couple of years, the momentum has shifted away from hardcore materialism 
And now Orthodox Christian believers are going to have to defend particular doctrines and particular biblical teachings. They're going to have to defend the idea of a personal God and explain why specific theologies are true guides for behavior today. The alternative to that is not another version of naturalism, 2.0, 3.0, or 8.0. The alternative to that is neural Buddhism. Right, and you got to get this one if you look at some of the works of Deepak Chopra, kind of the beginnings of this idea of neural Buddhism. Uh, last thing, as we as we close down here, thanks. You guys have been great. You're, uh, I appreciate your attention and your uh, your attendance. What we hear a lot is this: none of the arguments for God work. Right? We hear this all the time. I'm sure you probably heard it at university. They've all been tried, and we know they're they're false. We know they don't really work. That you know they've all been they've all failed spectacularly, and we've moved past the idea of a higher power. I wanted to let you know since about 1968, there's been a an an unbe unexpected shift in philosophy departments across uh, Europe and America. An unbelievable shift where high level, <laughs> intricately thought out. Uh, uh, explanations and, and uh, justifications for theism are being offered by intelligent philosophers that are theists. In other words, theism is finally being represented well in philosophy departments. Um, let me give you a, a philosopher of religion named um, William Wainwright. The current situation is very different now. Since about 1970, important philosophers are now prepared to defend arguments for God's existence. Many argue that traditional concepts of the divine are not only meaningful, but also are superior to alternatives. In their opinion, classical theistic metaphysics is still viable. Let me give you some examples of people that hold a major teaching post in philosophy at universities, major post at major universities across the country that are outspoken theists and defend theism regularly. Um, Keith Ward, Oxford University, Peter Vanawagen, Brian Leftow, Robert Adams, William Alston, Peter Crave, Stephen Evans, John Hare, Richard Swinburne, Alvin Plantinga, Notre Dame, Mark Linville, Alexander Pruss, Stephen Davis, Robert Coons, Nicholas Wolterstorff, George Mavrodis, Jerry Walls, Eleanor Stump, Merrill Westfall, Greg Gansel, Paul Copan, the, Robert Maydole, Michael Murray, Ed Fezzer, the list goes on and on and on and on. These are people holding post, not just at Christian schools, at secular schools, that defend the idea of God's existence. So much so that one of the best atheistic philosophers out there is Western Michigan's Quentin Smith. Listen to what uh, Quentin Smith says about this, uh, this sort of rising uh, tide of, uh, of philosophers, right? Um, oh, actually, I don't, I've got the quote right here. Let me make sure I give you, I want to give you the, uh, the Quentin Smith quote here. Um, uh, da, 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 da. All right. Um, well... Well, I thought I had it here. Here's the point. <laughs> Sorry about that. The one quote I didn't have with me. Um, Quentin Smith said basically this. I'm a little bit worried about how passive my naturalist philosopher friends are. There are growing, a what he called a wave of intelligent theists that are coming into the philosophy. You know, in philosophy departments, they're supposed to be able to think longer, go down deeper, hold their breath longer than other thinkers, right? That's the idea. And he said, one of the last strongholds of God not being dead, but God being alive and defended well is in philosophy departments across America and Europe. So interestingly, a, a seismic shift has taken place. So again, when somebody says there's just no good reasons to believe in God, there's just no good evidence to believe in God, there's just, uh, it's, it's all the arguments for God fail spectacularly. You don't even need to worry about it. It's a settled conclusion that theism's over, done, finished. They're either misinformed or they're lying. This is not the case now. And I want to make, just say if, if, these guys that I've brought to you, and I'm right, naturalism seems to be the thing that's been tried and found wanting rather than the traditional idea of theism. Thank you guys very much for your time. I'll take your questions in just a second. On that day, we will sing of the name more excellent than angels, a purified bride, refined heart, speech, and mind.